welcome to the Mint House event today as we explore the question, what practical next steps can be taken to move towards greater use and embedding of restorative approaches within the police force in the UK. It's really great to see you here and really lovely to see that so many people are interested in this topic and want to come uh, today to explore it more. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Mint House, don't know who I am, my name is Joy, I'm the Communications and Development Officer at the Mint House. Um, the Mint House is a centre for restorative practice based in Oxford, um, and we aim to see restorative justice in practice embedded and used in a variety of settings. Um, so we do various activities to promote that. Um, however, one of the ways that we do that is through events such as this, um, to really try to see um, things move forward um, and really try to promote research, try to promote practice. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, if you signed up today um, using the free ticket option, which is absolutely great, um, but you do have some resources that you could contribute financially and you would like to do so, um, you can actually donate on our website. Um, and that really helps us to be able to put on events like this one in the future and make them accessible for everyone so that we don't have to have a compulsory charge. Um, so I'll just pop the donate link in the chat there in case you um, want to do that. We'd be really, really grateful if we're able to do that. And we recognize not everyone will have that resource, but if you do, that'd be great. Um, you probably got a notification as this started um, that I am recording today's event. Um, you will only appear on the recording if you choose to ask a question via video or join the discussion and via video later on in the event today. So it's wonderful to see all your faces. It's really nice to see people with their, their cameras on so we get a sense of who's in the room. Um, but don't worry, you shouldn't appear in that recording unless you choose to take part in the discussion, but also just be aware of that if that's something that you want to do later that you will appear on the recording. So today we have two speakers with us, which is amazing. Um, we have Dr. Kerry Clamp with us, who is an Associate Professor in Criminology at the University of Nottingham here in the UK. Much of her research focuses on the application of restorative justice in policing and community settings. Um, and she also previously held the role of Chair of Trustees at the Restorative Justice Council. So she's very knowledgeable about restorative justice. And I really look forward to hearing what she has to say today, particularly from that sort of research and academic perspective. Um, we also have um, Paul McCarthy here, um, who is a experienced practitioner. Um, he started his career working in Gloucester Prison, but um, has done a variety of things across his career, um, specifically later running um, restorative forums, which brought together police and young people. And um, so I think he's hopefully going to be sharing a little bit about that today. Um, he also has facilitated and continues to facilitate a wide range of restorative justice cases. So it's wonderful to see them here today. Um, and yes, I think without further ado, I'll hand over to Paul. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces and uh, a lot of new faces as well. Um, it's great to be able to sort of uh, get together with everybody through this medium. Um, and, um, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about um, our youth forums, which were uh, bringing police officers and young people together. Um, to talk about the impact of, of their behaviours on each other and the impact of their interactions. And the project sort of stemmed from a need to improve relationships between police and young people. Um, so a colleague of mine, Charlotte Colkin, and I developed um, a, a, a four hour session um, bringing, bringing police and young people together. And it used restorative approaches and theatre games um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to reach our aims. And the aim was for them to understand the impact of their behaviours on each other, to build uh, understanding and empathy, and to look at different ways of, intera of interacting with each other. So we worked in two areas. We worked in Gloucestershire and we worked in Northampton. And the aim was to bring together 100 officers and 100 young people in each area, uh, which we did in groups of sort of 20 or so officers and 20 young people. Uh, we, the officers, uh, were nominated in most cases by their inspectors. 
and it was based on their roles and needs. Um, because there are a range of people nominating, uh, the different groups had sort of um, different cohorts of officers. Some, some inspectors would choose a whole cohort of officers didn't, who didn't get on very well with young people. Um, that part of it was out of our control, but others, others provided a good mix. Um, you know, the aim was to have a balance of response of officers, neighbourhood officers, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, the young people were drawn from youth clubs, schools, alternative provision units, and they came from uh, diverse backgrounds. Um, the only thing with the, with, the young, with, with selecting young people was that they should have had a contact of some kind with, with police, whether it was good or, or, or bad. Um, so the approach was for the young people and the officers to share experiences. We followed the restorative approaches model and we prepared both parties. So we met the, 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 the challenging part was finding young people, to be honest, enough young people. Um, so finding 10 cohorts of young people in Northampton and another 10 in Gloucestershire was quite a challenge. So that involved going to youth clubs, etc., and spending time with young people. Um, a great hook was, um, do you get on with police officers? Um, would you like to tell us about your experiences? And would you like to have an opportunity to talk to police officers in a safe place about how, how you feel um, about, about your relationship with them? Um, and those sessions, the sessions that we spent with the young people, were really quite dynamic. Um, lots and lots of ideas uh, came forward. So we'd spend an evening with them. Um, and then those that wanted to take part, we'd probably go back to them again and plan how a meeting with officers was going to, going to look. So, you know, very much the restorative model of preparation before going into the meeting. Did the same thing with officers. That was a challenge actually to get off, get officers to spend the time to actually come, come with us. So what we ended up doing with them was going from um, workplace to workplace and, and uh, talking to them sort of individually that way. Um, so, Things that came up uh, from young people um, was attitude, officers' attitudes, ways that they addressed young people, um, treatment in custody, treatment when reporting a crime, um, treatment when being asked to move on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and stop and search. That, that was another, another area that people wanted to talk about. Um, so the meeting itself, um, or the session itself, was about four hours long. Um, and initially, the officers would sit on one side. It was it was a circle with the two two of us in in, in the circle. Uh, the officers and the young people were often quite apprehensive um, about coming into the circle, um, and would sit. Uh, together, so officers on one side, young people on the other, which we found was helpful j just just in those first in the, in, in, the, in the first part of the meeting. We then split them up um, and get them to get an officer to sit next to a young person and get them to talk to each other about themselves with an aim of introducing them themselves. So an officer introducing a young person, the young person introducing an officer. Um, that was interesting because they had to support each other to to do to to do their introduction so that started to break down barriers then uh, the next part of the meeting was a, an exchange of shared experiences so these were experiences that they spoken to us in preparation so we knew what was coming um and we we we'd ordered the um the the the, the, the we we put into order um or warn people who, who was going to speak in, 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 in more order. Um, 
some of the things that sh uh, were shared, officers, some officers shared how it was, how how things had been for them when they were young pe people, their experiences um, of, of meeting police themselves as young people. They spoke about what it's like to approach a group of young people, how it is to work with young people when they're victims, when they're in difficulties, and sharing their experiences of policing, good and bad, and sharing their why. So why they're police officers, rather than rather than what they do, why they do it, why they joined. Um, young people spoke about conflict in the community. Um, uh, we worked with a group of travellers who, um, tra a young young travellers who were constantly being moved on because they wanted to mix with young people in the local community. They couldn't, um, it was difficult for them to meet in the community. It was difficult for people outside the traveller community to come into the traveller area. So they were finding places that they could, they could, they could mix, which was causing conflict and they were getting moved on. Um, uh, there was a, a there, you know, look a, a lot of cases of um, report trying to report things and not feeling that they weren't being listened to. So lots of, there were the lots lots of issues that young people brought brought to these forums. Um, through these experiences, young people started to see officers as individuals, uh, where they had originally seen them all, as all the same. Um, and officers saw the impact of their behaviours, but also had an opportunity to explain why they did what they did. One interesting thing that came up time and time again from young people was why do officers walk with their thumbs in their utility vests? <laughs> and they found that quite intimidating. Um, and the explanation that most officers gave was quite interesting. They don't do it because they're intimidate. They want to intimidate. They do it because they're not allowed to put their hands in their pockets and they don't have anywhere else to put their hands. So it's easier to hook them in there and they're not in their pockets. So just, just explaining simple little things about what they did um, was, 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 was um, really constructive. So that part of the session lasted for uh, one and a half to two hours. Not everybody spoke, um, but most people did. Uh, most people exchanged experiences. Um, after that, uh, we broke for pizza. Um, that was one of the biggest stresses, hoping that the pizzas would be delivered on time. <laughs> um, but we broke for pizza where people uh, integrate, in, reintegrated with each other. So the, you know, the officers and young people sat together to eat pizza. And there we there you, you witnessed the, um, the informal conversation, you know, the conversation about which football club you, we, you support, in, um, what you do in your spare time, um, what television programs you enjoy, but also, um, it was an opportunity for one-to-one -one conversation where maybe some complex or traumatic experiences had been shared. So, for instance, there was a young woman in one of the sessions who had been sexually assaulted um, and reported it and had a bad experience. And as a result of that, had a phobia of going anywhere near a police station. Um, it was as much as she, she wanted to share her experience, but it was as much as she could do to enter the room with 10 police officers. Um, and so we had to do a lot of work with her and with the officers that were attending um, to manage this and make it safe. Um, but in that reintegration session, she went off and had a one-to-one -one with a uh, with a with a female police officer um, and the outcome was she was six months down the line she was able to go and have a ride around in a police vehicle with this police officer um, and they 
re-examined the allegations that she had made um, two years previous. Um, and a lot of her issues were resolved. Um, and there were one or two um, uh, experiences that were shared that led to that in both Northampton and in and in uh, Gloucester. So that was the use of the sort of reintegration uh, sessions. Um, following that, um, we used theatre games to um, break down barriers around um, around language. So you, one game to show that. The same words can have different meanings. So we just had a short script, a script around the greeting. Hello, how are you? Um, what are you doing today? Um, and we asked an officer and a young person to read the script in a way, in an indifferent way, in a way where they believed the other person had stolen from them, in a way that they believe that they they had stolen from the other person. Um, so that 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 indicates that the that, that the use of language can have a different influence depending on how how what emphasis you use. Um, and then another game we had was to change the status of people. Um, simple game: you stick a playing card on everybody's forehead. If you've got high a high number, you're a high status. If you've got a low number, you're low status. Uh, and then you just ask people to walk around. They don't know what they've got on their head. But you get them to walk around reacting to people in the way that their status is indicated on their forehead. Um, and we engineered it so that some of the officers were low status um, and some of the young people were high status. Um, and simply by it, it, it enables the wearer to understand what it's like um, when you have a low status or a higher status. Um, and that was quite revealing, both for young people, both for the young people, but also for the officers to, to, to understand what it's like. So it's not, wasn't using language, it was just by demeanor, the way you look at people. Um, so that was quite impactful. Uh, then we played a fun game at the end um which again I, at that point uh it would if the officers weren't wearing uniforms it would have been difficult to distinguish who the officers were and who the young people were so a simple game like wink murder for instance uh where you're all sat in your ring sat in the circle um that that's how we finished the uh, the the session um and that was just followed by takeaways so a 10 minute session of people talking about um what they take what they'd learned from the session um just a few takeaways i've got here an officer takeaway was we must learn from this experience i am disappointed that young people have such a poor opinion of the police um another the officer must engage more with young people I hope some of the officers who treat young people badly attend. I am encouraged by the interaction I've seen. And tonight we will not just get in our cars and drive away. Uh, a young person, I hope the police will get as good a perception of us as we now have of them. Um, it's a shame some officers out there are giving us bad name. It's good to see relationships being built um and finally i want to find your curb attitude if affects behavior so i want to find your curb that was an officer talking to um a young traveler who said the only place that i've got to meet with my friends is sitting on a curb and we get moved on from there and uh, so the outcome of that was i want to find your curb and that, in a nutshell, was um, was the uh, was the uh, was the intervention that, that that we did with officers and young people, or the forum that we did with the officers and young people. Um, as I said, there were ten sessions in each county, um, and uh, well, we've got a whole raft of of, of um, material that we collected. Um, finally, 
uh, some of the young people and some of the officers came back for a sort of evaluation session um, following this, uh, where they looked at what we'd harvested from the uh, from the events, um, posed some questions, um, and tried to find some answers around how um, officers or how how policing. It, policing in, in, in the two areas could be more effective for young people. Thank you. That's so interesting. Um, I think we'll come to questions and discussion at the end, um, I think, just to keep it all together. Um, but I know I have a few questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep, hold my tongue for now. Um, Kerry, would you be happy to share your presentation? And then, like I said, we'll come to some questions and discussion when you're finished. Sorry, I know I'm chatting to myself. Just give me two seconds. I'm just trying no to um, just make sure I can share the right screen. So if you can just let me know if you can see this. Yeah, great. Yeah, we can see your screen. I'm just going to um, oh, go over here so I can see people rather than... Can you still see the screen? We can, yeah. yeah. We can just go back to the slides. So you're not on your first slide. The moment. There we go. All right. Thank you so much for everybody coming along. And thanks so much, Paul, for sharing that account of your um, forum with us. Um, we had the benefit of talking through our, our perspectives with each other. Um, and so it was good to use some of that in terms of my thinking about where to next for, for restorative policing. If we think about what restorative policing is, we know that there are a lot of problems with policing. How do we move forward in this? And so, so that's kind of the the challenge I set myself. Um, and I am going to draw on my own um, empirical data collection, my own pilot study that I collaborated with, with uh, Terry O'Connell. And I know David Moore is one of the attendees again. So I'm really excited that he's here every time I get to be in the same room with, with him. Oh, oh, same room with him is a delight. So, um, you know, he'll recognize some of the things that I talk about through here. All right. So, for people that have seen me present before, I generally start with two slides. So you might be bored, I promise there's no repetition after that. But I think it's really important to note that there are different definitions of restorative policing. The most common one that we talk about quite often is it's a process, right? It's a meeting between people, conversations go on, um, where messages are passed directly from stakeholders or through a facilitator to stakeholders where um, perhaps participants don't want to participate directly, but still want to engage with one another. Importantly then, and these, these second two aspects is, is what I tend to focus on in my own research. And it is restorative policing as a verb, right? So how, how can police officers act restoratively in a day-to-day? -day? How can they integrate some values and principles into their, their policing practice? And so we would think of this as a more relational approach, right? Um, the second is restorative policing as an ideal. So this is about moving forward from where we are now into some different um kind of mode of policing and and so this is kind of what i talk about a lot of my work and this is what i really um, will be focusing on in this presentation um, right so the next is a um is one of peel's principles and it says that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it so for me that should really underpin policing decisions policing priorities and policing behaviors. Because if in my mind, obviously this is, this is a stretch, we don't really know, but ideally if police officers had a more relational approach and integrated restorative processes and practices into, in their day-to-day -day policing, and also in terms of how the policing organization itself works, then hopefully we would see less crime and we would see less evidence of police officers conducting, you know, um, random searches, random, supposedly. I'm sure it is for some, uh, but not for all, right? So, so those are the kind of two things that I keep coming back to when I think about this. So any policing uh, practitioners would challenge, and I've had scholars challenge uh, at the same time that perhaps I'm a little bit off with the fairies, right? Because this doesn't really sit very well with operational policing in terms of the demands on time and resources, et cetera. 
but also more importantly within the policing literature we see this kind of question of identity culture and loss coming through so the first thing is that police officers have a really solid understanding or, or view of themselves as crime fighters right they're there to to protect the goodies from the baddies and that kind of mentality will always shape and frame action so Chris Kaneen um, draws attention to, and he's, he's just got a, um, a podcast out and his, his book is coming hot off the press. And I listened to that podcast. Um, I'm a big fan of Chris Kaneen. Um, not that anybody else needs to be, but yeah. Um, but he, he talks about the fact that police officers aren't trained, right, to respond to different kinds of people who have a whole range of factors that might be informing, addressing, um, uh, and driving particular behaviors forward. They're not, that's not how they are trained. They're tra trained to react, right? Ian Loder also tells us that police officers are really trained or encouraged or motivated to develop discursive relationships with the populations that they police. So that provides another kind of barrier to thinking and acting in that way. And that's not to say that there aren't brilliant police officers out there who do all of these things, of course they are. But if we're looking at policing culture broadly in England and Wales and beyond, these are kind of things that come through and they have stayed that way since uh, policing research first really took hold back in the 1970s, 60s, 70s. Police officers also hold a really pragmatic view of their work, right? And if you speak to police officers, it's common sense. So when you start talking about highly abstract, highly theorized concepts and frameworks for practice, they're a bit, they, you know, it's a bit of a skeptical reaction that you face sometimes. So there is this this kind of moral imperative that they have that they have to be crime fighters and that they have to protect the goodies from the baddies and their job is primarily about locking people up, operational police officers, um, that, that trying to shift that view to thinking about how we might undertake more proactive rather than reactive action is can be quite, um, quite challenging, I guess. We have another issue with, uh, with policing organizations in that they are very hierarchical and very bureaucratic, right? And that naturally as human beings, we tend to imitate the behavior that we're exposed to, right? So if you think about us in our families, we, we generally have similar values to our parents. We treat each other, we model behavior that we see between our parents with, with our subsequent relationships, whether those be friends or um, you know, intimate relationships. So there is, it is unsurprising that the policing institution has an impact on frontline practice. So very often it is directional, it is you will go and do X, Y, and Z. These are our priorities. You need to, you need to, um, you need to abide by these rules or there will be consequences. So it's not surprising then that many frontline practitioners will model that behavior out in their interactions with the public. But we know that a directive approach doesn't work for community members, especially those who feel that they are police the subject of the policing gaze as opposed to being protected. Um, and it doesn't work for police officers either, right? So there is this kind of drive for an increased focus on victims, on satisfaction and on legitimate policing. But what we really need is policing organizations to start you know, imitating those behaviors, not imitating, I mean, hopefully it's genuine, but, but signaling those behaviors to the police officers that work for them. So police culture in very broad terms is how officers think about and interact with the social world around them, right? And we know that people say police culture is problematic and it needs to change, but there are there is very little evidence to say that police culture has changed, right? It's policing as an institution is referred to as one of the, the last bastions um, of reform, right? This, we, we seem to have really ingrained practices and, and not much evidence of very proactive policing taking place across the board. Don't forget that I'm talking about in, in, in high level terms here, not you know, really progressive practices, etc. And there are kind of two things that, that I guess pin 
culture in place. And one is that any attempts to reform the, reform the institution from the outside in will do it through policies, but policies are broad enough and open to enough interpretation that we can operationalize them in ways that make sense to us, right? And also the nature of policing is invisible. I mean, people will see police officers, they will see them engaging with the public, they will see them conducting stop and stop and search, and they will see them um, arresting individuals. But a lot of that policing behavior is developed, shaped, and informed by individuals, not by everybody else, right? So, so we can see these challenges in policing organizations. So the argument that I have and that I make uh, often in my work is that we need a kind of more holistic approach to police cultural change if we're going to do anything. We, we can't only have structural sh uh, shifts in policing practice or policing policies. We also need to have behavioral and attitudinal changes on the part of policing. And that in part, I think, is, is where Paul's forums come in, is that it's trying to change attitudes, behaviors, and interactions between groups of people who may not feel um, protected, I guess, uh, or, or but, you know, attacked by the police instead of protecting them. So we, we can understand from a public perspective that policing has to change, right? Because the police rely on the public to do their jobs. Um, they get intelligence from them. They, they, they figure out who suspects are. They, they need the public to report. Otherwise they wouldn't have a job to do. But what we also know about policing, um, you know, that's that's emerging is, is increased resignations, right? Police officers aren't necessarily experiencing um, the policing organization is one that is is perhaps um, one that enables them to achieve what they want to achieve, whether that be promotion or whether that be being able to make a difference, right? To have a voice in the way that policing is conducted, but also importantly, poor leadership. And that comes in a variety of forms, right? And we know from, from uh, some studies that have been done, um, one of my colleagues, Kim Pease, talks about change in policing um, as killing the cub, and in part that is driven by promotional practices. So it's much easier to kill a project that's happening and create your own in order to progress than to keep what you already have that's working well. So there's this kind of competition that's happening as well. We also know that the Independent Office for Police Complaints, uh, their most recent support, uh, sorry, not support, their report, shows that, um, that for the first time, public kind of views of police is more negative than positive. So that's the first time that, that the data is starting to show that. And that's driven by a whole range of things. Um, you know, particularly in England and Wales, we know Sarah Everard's murder, you know, downing street parties, a whole range of things are informing public perceptions on this. So, so there is a, a practitioner desire for the organization to change, but also a public desire for that to change. So here are some ingredients that I'm putting forward for restorative policing in the 21st century. I'm, we know from discussions that I've had with police officers that the most of them join because they want to make a difference. But very few, when you speak to them, and these are whether they're new recruits, you know, they've been there for a medium term or they're just about to retire, we know that a lot of them will say, I wanted to do and achieve a lot more than I've been able to in my role. And this, this is for a whole host of reasons, right? And this quote here was from an officer who, who had 10 years service. And he said, I think people come into the police now with a naive sense that they're going to be able to change the world and save people and lock all the baddies away. And it just isn't the case. I enjoy everything that I do, but I just think you have to become accustomed to the fact that failure is quite a big thing in policing. And I really felt for him, you know, he was like, I just have to accept this. This is part of the job and I need to let those naive thoughts go. But then we asked the question, well, how, how do you make a difference? I know you're saying that you don't make a difference, but are there any moments in time where you feel that you have made a difference? And the comments that have generally come back are from interactions with people, right? 
primarily victims that they're dealing with, sometimes perpetrators as well. But that's where they, they identify this kind of moment that they're having with people, right? So the first quote is about receiving an email from a woman saying, thank you so much for helping me. And this cop was kind of a bit surprised because he's, I haven't even done anything yet, which is bizarre, but clearly his interaction with that person was good and meant something to her. And another example is that some, some police officers that there's a lot of judgment that goes on between police officers and policing styles. Um, and one of them was talking about the fact that young kids don't put their finger up to him when he drives past. They actually wave and they say hello. And he, he described that as being about or because he took the time to talk to them. He took the time to say hello. He took the time to wave. And therefore that kind of behavior is reciprocated. So these are two quite interesting examples of how police can make a difference and what what I argued in the reports back to the constabulary is perhaps what we should be focusing on a little bit more is what we can do rather than you know solving all of these problems you know that we actually don't have control over there's another element in policing it is that the current operational the, the mode of operational practice in policing is that police officers are individuals. So they might go to briefings on a regular basis, but they will be briefed by their, their line manager on incidents that are happening or what needs to happen today. Very rarely are they having interactions across teams and working together in a police station to A, understand what the problems are and B, to work collaboratively, collaboratively to fix this. Right. And there was a real indication that they would welcome co more collaborative opportunities and, and they could see that this would have a significant um, impact on, on their efficiencies, their effectiveness, their relationships with the community. And that came from uh, operational staff, but it also came from um, management staff. So that was interesting. So the first thing I would argue is that police the policing organization and individuals involved in it need to be having the right conversations internally, right? So they need to be having structured conversations, restorative conversations, right? That whereby they can all participate, identify priorities and develop shared ways of working. So they need to develop the space and this time to go through a range of questions so that they can all be a part of identifying and analyzing the problem but also working out how they can address it through action. And then that provides an opportunity for them to hold each other to account at the same time once they've agreed ways of working. And this needs to happen on a regular basis. This also requires, I would argue, for the policing institution to review their use of force policies, right? And to think of ways that they can integrate restorative principles into their practice being less reactive. I watched four police officers, I went out on a ride along and uh, there was this guy who was really, really drunk and he had stolen a bottle of wine from a shop. They called it in. We all went, two police cars there, the two cops with me jumped out, the other two jumped out, they jumped on him. I mean, he could barely stand. So I didn't know why the four of them needed to be doing that. And you could see that because one of them turned around and went, she's in the car and they all stepped back. It just wasn't necessary, it seems bizarre, right? But I guess that was a bit of excitement for them for the evening. Um, you also, we also need to use data and analytics much better, right? We need to draw on that to understand, well, where, what is happening in this community that we are responsible for serving, right? And I think that we need to think about the language, just as Paul said, that we use, uh, moving away from we are policing this area to we're serving this area. And there also needs to be greater account accountability and transparency through the policing organization. That's really important that everybody is held to high ethical standards. The next thing that should happen from that, from that experiential process is that police officers on the front line would then start having the right conversations with the people that they come across, right? And what we tried to get across is that you need to be having these using open-ended questions so that individuals can tell their story in their own voice, identify the problems, but also more importantly, to indicate what could help this, what could solve this. So they need to be developing a collaborative 
relationship with individuals. So we gave the, we gave a range and, and these slides will be shared so, so you'll have this, but you know, a range of kind of key ineffective prompts for conversations are with uh, members of the public and also to explain why. But you know, we wanted officers to move away from identifying the problem, saying what the action is and what the consequences would be to having a much discursive relationship with people, whether they're in the right or the wrong, and to have a more procedurally just interaction with them, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that they have to give everybody cuddles or not crime anyone, they, they can do that. Um, but just there are, are other ways of getting to the same endpoint where the experience would be much better. So I think an important thing like Paul's forums is to have broader interaction and visibility in the public, in, in, in the public domain, right? Through town hall meetings or other community policing initiatives um, with particular segments of the population, whether it's young people, whether it's, um, you know, people that are, that are new to the area, et cetera. We need to have this dialogue between the police and the public inside the community. I think that that's really important because it changes the dynamic at the same time. It is also important, I know that Gloucester Police do some of this, is that it's important to have restorative interactions between police and members of the public where conflict arise between them. And it's important not only for the public to understand that there are consequences to their actions and decisions, but also police officers and having, um, I guess, a, a process through which to engage with one another and to hold each other to account can improve those relationships exponentially. Um, okay, right. So just some quick con concluding thoughts then. So what I would argue is that restorative policing requires two things. The first is new tools in the toolbox. Of course it is, right? Whether that's restorative questions, whether that's processes, whatever. But that will always remain really confined and ineffectual in influencing the whole organization or the, the section or, you know, the, the you know, constabulary or, or whatever it is if you don't also at the same time have a reframing, a radical reframing of the way that we see crime problems and what good solutions are. And it's important that police officers start having or being provided the space to have those conversations and to have an influence on how policing is run in their area. So in short, we need to redefine restorative policing so that it's a new mode of go governing crime that seeks to stimulate new forms of behavior, but also to stop negative ones, right? It's a framework to develop the police, uh, the function of the police as a social agent that is increasingly reliant on partnerships because without partnerships, we're really gonna be ineffective and demand is just going to increase and increase and increase. And restorative justice, practices more broadly in day-to-day -day policing should look to increase forms of social capital um, across the communities that they serve. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kerry. That's really helpful and really interesting and my mind is my mind is buzzing. Um, if anyone has a question that they would like to raise, feel free to put it in the chat if you don't want to ask it directly. Otherwise, use the raise hand function. And I'll try to come to as many questions as possible. Um, I guess the first question that I had was for Paul on the back of um, what you were sharing. It sounds like it's you know, obviously very interesting um, work working with the young people and police. Do you see there being a place for similar forums between, kind of as Kerry was saying, sort of other groups within the general public, not just young people. Do you think that would ever be a situation where that might actually feasibly happen? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I do. I do think um, it, uh, it has um, potential for working in all kinds of, uh, of communities. Um, I have seen, I mean, we, we, we have run a forum in the past with um, police officers, PCSOs, um, and um, and a community um, that was in conflict with each other. So, um, yeah, I've, se I've seen it work there. And as Kerry was saying, um, working with people that are new to new to an area, working with groups of people that don't have good relationships with uh, with with the police, certainly, certainly, it's a model that would work. Yeah. Great. 
Um, I, yeah, I would love to see more of that happening. Um, Kerry, we have a question for you from Crispian um, saying, do you, um, does Kerry have any proposals on the resource implications of her sweeping reforms? In short, is it possible? <laughs> so a bit of a hard question for you there, but could you ever see any of this happening? If so, how might, might that happen? So a, a lot of this work was developed, uh, well not developed, uh, has, has explored kind of practice that initially started in Australia in the early 1990s, end of the 1980s, early of the 1990s. Um, and so there are already case studies that show that this can work, it doesn't require tons of resourcing. It's always good to have evaluation there to, um, you know, to, to capture information, to share learning, to make sure that everybody is, has an equal voice. But that type of practice already happened and it was shown to have quite significant impacts very quickly. So uh, uh, chief constables have said to me before, yeah, but this, you know, this is like, we're only gonna start seeing results in three years time. And I was like, no, no. In, in pilot studies, we've seen that you'll have results within, you know, six to 12 months and you can do this, but it's about having a different relationship. And I think it's not about necessarily going out and getting a whole lot of new training and bringing consultants in or academics or anything like that, but it is about having a different conversation. And I know some inspectors that, that have changed their practice within their teams that are having these open conversations that are bringing in uh, community neighborhood officers, response officers, um, you know, into the room together to talk about the area that's policing and to develop strategies. And more importantly, for sergeants and those inspectors to be having meetings between them to say, what is your approach? What's working for you? What isn't working? This is what I'm doing. How can we make sure that there is some continuity of practice across what we're doing? Um, you know, I think that it's, it's always a good idea to experiment first. You know, I, I can't ever see a, a a constabulary or a force or service saying right tomorrow we're waking up we're going to retrain everybody and that was attempted in greater manchester police right um when, when i was doing research there in, in 2011 um all frontline officers were trained in restorative practices and we saw that in durham as well in durham the chief constable's driver was even tra trained in restorative justice so that he could have those conversations in the pub with the people that they came across and say have you heard about this this can happen that can happen so i don't think that training on its own is a solution, that restorative processes on their own are a solution to cultural change, but the way that we in interact with each other in our day-to-day -day policing life and also in terms of organizational support is really, really important. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, I think that someone has their hand up. The name is just says Robert's iPad. So I'm not sure of your name, but if you want to introduce yourself and if you have a question or a comment, you'll have to unmute yourself. Hi, sorry. Yeah, it's um, my name's Jane. Um, I just wondered whether there's been any studies where once the RJ approaches, maybe it's more for Paul, I don't know, have been used and adopted because I, I'm much more with youth um, justice actually. And obviously young people don't have um, great relationships with the police, obviously. Um, whether anybody's actually monitored any studies of the difference of when positive approaches from the police have been made how it has affected the young person's outcome because as you know in court you know their journey is about their offense and not about their own traumas so it's just wondering whether that there's any data from from studies that have actually shown that it does make a difference to promote the use of rj going forward carrier paul do either of you have any anything that comes to mind I think, I think, well, I think that there was a lot going on in there. We know, um, for example, from Wagga Wagga that there was a reduction um, in repeat offending by 40%. Um, all cases went through a conferencing process. The community was involved. So we know that it does have an impact on the lives of young people and police officers in terms of job, job satisfaction, etc. Um, I think that, you know, the initiatives that, that Paul describes can the, the research data, the evaluations that have been conducted on those types of initiatives have indicated that relationships between the individuals that have been involved in that um, forum will improve. 
but that there isn't necessarily a ripple effect across the policing institution. So, you know, I th and I think that that kind of underpins the, the, the push to think about how we can police differently rather than how we can have siloed initiatives. And I like to think about it, and I'm not saying that they're not effective, of course not, but I, from, from my own personal perspective, I do think it's the same like taking a person out of society and imprisoning them, right? We're going to teach you the consequences of not abiding by the law, the, the normative standards in society, and then we're going to put you back in society and hope that outside in that artificial environment, it's going to make you a more functional person outside. And we know that isn't true. So I think that the more authentic interactions that we can have in communities with people that will increase the, the intelligence. But I also think in terms of social capital, that's really important. Police officers can't do everything, nor should they, but they, what they should be able to do is have a collaborative relationships with organizations that can help respond to some of those issues in a more effective way. So, so cooperative working across agencies is incredibly important. And unfortunately we don't have that, right? everybody's protecting their own fiefdom and they don't like to pull resources. So it's a challenge. So really what you're saying, it's a not just the policing, even though it's the, the police who do the, the, the arrests and the negative work, but actually really what you're saying is it's a community. It needs ambassadors in the community to promote healthy communities. Well, absolutely. But police officers also have a role to play in that, right? Whenever anybody's in trouble, they call the police, whether it's a crime or not. And we know that, that police officers spend probably a good 80% of their time responding to non-crime incidents. So they are a part of the solution, but that requires us to, to, to frame our definition of what policing is differently. Yeah. yeah. And also for that to have an and, and for that to have an impact on the communities as well. Um, the uh, the programme in Gloucestershire, uh, it was evaluated and we did see a shift in the young people and the attitudes to, um, to, to police. Um, and we did see a shift from officers as well. However, it doesn't, it's not a standalone piece of work. Um, as Kerry said, you need collaboration and that yeah. collaboration needs to be on, on, yeah. ongoing. <laughs> Can I just ask one further, Paul, why did you choose those two areas? Yeah. Uh, we were commissioned, we were commissioned by those areas. So Northampton um, approached Restorative Solutions and asked for a programme um, and Gloucestershire the same. Thanks. Great. Um, I've seen another Paul that has the hand up. Um, would you like to, to share? And just as a shock for everybody, this is Becky and not Paul. <laughs> I didn't want you to think I was Paul in disguise. <laughs> but we just wanted to say, like, in Cleveland, actually, we feel really lucky with the relationship and the attitude of the police. Yep. Um, we've got um, Jane, who, you know, who's our police RJ coordinator, who's actually co-located with us, and the police pay for that role and for her training and her development because they know that she needs she needs that to be a, a great practitioner and the difference it's made to our engagement from police officers and establishing pathways with the more I guess harder to reach departments like CID and the sex offender management units to second to none yep. um, get yourselves an RJ police coordinator <laughs> everybody needs one <laughs> they're indispensable and, and you know from research surveys that have conducted across the country about what what the uh, economic model is in terms of commissioned service providers etc as you say the most successful ones are integrated with the police but there is a yeah. there is a warranted police officer that is an ambassador for the program and that is so important in terms of legitimacy within the police of letting go of their cases to other people and, and and thinking about things differently so you're absolutely right yeah and I think you know Jane is Jane retired after 33 years with Cleveland police so it kind of brings with her obviously like a wealth of experience but like you say the credibility of those contacts with with the colleagues and because she has been a serving officer for that amount of time it just you know she, she knows what she's doing and it's it's obvious when she speaks and that she does so I mean, I spent, I spent a couple of years really integrated into the policing organization and we'd be sitting in, in meetings and they'd go, oh, you know, academics with their armchair theorizing, not you, Kerry. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. If you're not a cop, you aren't a cop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're not going to be integrated and accepted. And mm. so it is challenging. 
yeah absolutely but yeah thank you for that great and um, we only have a few minutes left and um, i have some two i would say kind of linked questions um from the chat one from david um asking do the speakers think that police culture is moving towards a more restorative culture or away from it or staying much the same and rosie asks um, do you detect interest in the transformation um, that Carrie describes among senior police leaders? So do you think it's going in the right direction, not staying the same? And also, do you think there are some senior leaders that actually might be interested in making some of these changes? Yeah, I think that that offices at the top of the policing organization more often than not are progressive. Operational cops on the front line know that what they're doing isn't working. They're, they're, the mid-level managers are the, are the culture blockers, and, and we know that that's evident in policing research and, and experience. Anybody who's worked with the police will know that that's the case. Um, and to illustrate the point, I conducted a one-to-one um, -one interviews with the 51 uh, officers that, that took part in the pilot, and one of them said to me, um, well, Sarge doesn't think that I really need to be engaging in this. He doesn't see it as a priority. So I don't want to talk to you. And I was like, oh, okay, nice meeting you. Bye. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that those messages are important. It's complicated. There isn't a, an easy option here. It's not, not a case of everybody saying, yeah, we, we're interested in this. Sometime, and as um, David Moore's new book um, is, is coming out later this year, that it is about knowing how to make this change and when you when you say oh we want to change the whole policing organization that's challenging how do you do that that's in the that's in the too difficult box you know the in tray over here so it's about having those those conversations those interactions and good experiences not all cops have had good experiences with restorative justice with restorative justice organizations with good relationships with youth offending teams and that's a real problem but what they forget is that those interactions were individuals, were with individuals, just like their interactions with individuals in the community can affect perceptions of the whole policing organization. So it's it's challenging. Yeah, um, we're just about to run out of time. But Paul, is there anything that you would want to add on top of that? Um, well, just, just to say that, you know, um, it, Restorative approaches and restorative justice is included in police training, um, but only a very small part of their training is around that. I think they get about a day, a day's input, and that's probably being generous. Um, so that I think, country, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, as you say, that varies across country. So mm -hmm. that's 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 a key area that where things need to change. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we are about out of time. I really, really appreciate both of you speaking today and thank you for those who asked questions and got involved as well. Um, I have an evaluation form that I would love people to fill out if you can, just sort of a bit of housekeeping here. Um, I've just put the link in the chat. So if you click on that link, then it will open up hopefully in your browser and then you can hopefully fill it out now. But if not, you won't lose the link. And we'll also send a follow up email next week. Um, with the link to the recording as well as the evaluation form and any sort of other follow-up materials if Kerry's happy to share her slides and um, I can also attach those as well. Um, so we really appreciate all of you being here today. Um, our next um, event is a CPD event on the topic of unconscious bias um, which will be in April and then we actually also have a one-day conference in May on the topic of communicating restorative justice and practice. So the CPD event is open for bookings now if you want to book on we're still finalising some of the final details for the conference, you can't look onto that yet, but if you want to, the links are also in the chat there, um, if you want to follow up on that, and if you want to make sure that you always hear about these things when they happen, um, please join our mailing list, either send me an email, or the easiest way is just to sign up directly on the link I've just also put in the chat, so just a little bit of housekeeping to, to finish up, please, please fill in the evaluation form if you can, um, and we're so happy that all of you could be here today, sorry we always run out of time, I feel like we always end up uh, rushing at the end and can't get to all the questions but um yeah really appreciate the discussion and the comments that people have been having as well so thank you very much and we look forward to seeing all of you hopefully an event soon and thank you again so much to paul and to carrie thanks so much everybody have a great day yeah yep, thank you very much goodbye have a good day Bye.